This has been some six or seven years in the making and ten years um, scratching my head over the books in Nigel Blair's library, reflecting on what I was taught as a child about religion. And so I can bring myself up to date, and if you're with me and come with me, that's marvellous, but have a look, um, and there'll be people who will uh, challenge what I'm saying, uh, concerned about what I'm saying. There are loads of references. Um, um, I will back all my statements up with evidence and support, but I have put an awful lot of people into this uh, who help to give us a wonderful story about um, Christianity, in particular what British, British Christianity was all about. So away we go. This is a supplement to Learning from History um, Part 2. Um, a lot of the uh, part two is what we call the Druid links to Karsag, in other words, going right back to the beginning, the Garden of Eden. Um, and I've added a lot of new material. Some of the old material is repeated, but I hope to give a clearer picture of just what an incredible history we all have uh, and how much we need to know about it, because it'll make us feel a lot better and give us a much better idea of how we should approach uh, each other, life, and the world as a whole. So it is an examination into religious history. Now, I, I picked this document to put at the top of the list because it's a contentious document, and it's something which upset me when I read it, because I'm being told here that if it isn't Roman Catholic, it's not a proper church. Pope tells Christians, Protestants accuse Rome of a lust for power. The Vatican notes defects of non-Catholic faiths. Anglican leaders react with dismay, accusing the Roman Catholic Church of paradoxical behavior. They said that the new 16-page document outlining the defects of non-Catholic churches constituted a major obstacle to ecumenicism. The document said that the Orthodox Church suffered from a wound because it did not recognize the primacy of the Pope. So the key thing here is this primacy of the Pope. Uh, the wound was still more profound in Protestant denominations, it added. It was difficult to see how the title church could possibly be attributed to them, said a statement from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Roman Catholicism was the one true Church of Christ. This moves the whole debate, this lovely quote from C.S. Lewis, I do not have a soul, I am a soul. And it moves the whole debate to the other extreme of personal belief and personal feelings uh, and how you feel about yourself and the world, I hope. Rupert Sheldrake's research is interesting. He says here, Descartes believed the only kind of mind was the conscious mind. And then Freud reinvented the unconscious. And then Jung said it's just a personal unconscious, uh, but collective unconscious. <laughs> and morphic resonance shows us that our very souls are connected with those of others and bound up in the world around us. And my own uh, work on animals um, um, and wildlife generally, um, there's an extraordinary dimension uh, which Konstantin Korotkov, the Russian scientist, has expanded and developed. And we're on new ground here, very exciting ground, I think. But what we're talking about is, in fact, what our ancestors believed. Our ancestors believed in the transmigration of the soul and in the spiritual world. And I think that's very important to try and go back and see what they thought about it and why they did it and what we can learn from the past. Now some of the names who will tell you how they saw things, and these are great scholars, William Blake on Druid history in Jerusalem. Your ancestors derived their origin from Abraham, Heber, Shem, and Noah, who were Druids, as the Druid temples, which are the patriarchal pillars and oak groves over the whole earth, witness to this day. You have a tradition that man anciently contained in his mighty limbs all things in heaven and earth. This she received from the Druids. Again, William Blake, all had originally one language and one religion. This was the religion of Jesus, the everlasting gospel. Antiquity preaches the gospel of Jesus. 
Another quote I found recently, um, which is, in my opinion, what I'm talking about, is that the Tuatha Dé Nan, or the ancestors of the Tuatha Dé Nan, are the likely originators of all religion. This source of the teaching of Jesus and the Brotherhood could be re-energized, just as Jesus tried to do, before others put words in his mouth after he died. I've tried to describe in simple language two paragraphs of how I see the ancient world, the ancient city-states, and this sums it up for me. Once upon a time in the civilized world, the monarch and the public servants who honored their oath of allegiance delivered to the people freedom, <coughs> justice, leisure, and instruction. By facilitating instruction and apprenticeship, the city-state encouraged each individual to develop special skills appropriate to the ascribed natural or genetic abilities of that individual to meet the many needs of the wider community. The pursuit of excellence in each department was a matter of honour, where self-interest led to a duty of care towards fellow citizens and the overall success of that community. And we see this in some of the great city-states like Mari, which at 4000 BC, you have over 200 craft trades and guilds. And peace. So the king's primary role here is very important. And the concept of kingship needs to be understood. We all have our ideas about monarchy today. It is nothing like it used to be, and I hope that will come through in what I'm talking about although we have wonderful examples of service for the people. And remember, the monarchy is a contract between the monarch and the people under our British Constitution, 1688-89 uh, Constitution and Rule of Law, which most people have forgotten all about. King's primary role, again, was to deliver to the people freedom, justice, leisure and instruction. Neither God nor king or the people were above the law. And the law was the edicts of Anu and Enil, the divine justice of the immortal gods who delivered kingship. And the um, basalt stele in the Louvre, uh, said to be the codes of Hamrabi, if you look at the top, it says very clearly, these are the edicts of An and Enil, or Anu and Enil. Excommunication was a punishment or deterrent for serious wrongdoing, in the Indo-European languages, Druid and Dharma both translates as strong knowledge. We find distinctly long-headed arrivals from the Eastern Mediterranean constructing the earliest long barrows and observatories from around 4200 BC in the British Isles, together with the wide introduction of mixed farming methods. And sites like side fields in Ireland, you have extraordinary central organization, clearing the land, big rectangular fields, complete package. You see there's reeves on Dartmoor, similar. And you see some really clever people getting to grips with communal activity and advanced planning and uh, centralized organization. And of course, in side fields, it was covered over by five or six feet of peat because the climate changed and got much colder and wetter and it was warm, the Holocene optimum, or the warmest period in our history, was round about that period of 4,200. Another angle of the ancient philosophy, the Tao is still a pillar of Chinese society. Words of Meng Zhu. Every person within themselves possesses the four principles of benevolence, justice, propriety, and wisdom, and that each person only has to obey the law within themselves in order to be perfect. Plato emphasized soon afterwards that good people do not need laws and bad people break them anyway. And words from I Ching, the Book of Changes, the superior person who sees not only things but the Tao of things is rare. The Tao of the universe is indeed kindness and wisdom, but essentially Tao is also beyond kindness and wisdom. The great um, linguist, scholar, Sir Alan Gardner, uh, who spent a lot of time in Germany before the First World War, where uh, archaeology was at its peak, um, and he was the key person who had uh, translated so much of the Egyptian 
hieroglyphs and texts. And he certainly uh, identified the bread cake, which was an interesting subject for Lawrence Gardner to follow up. Um, that's a separate subject. But he says here, from the Egyptian point of view, we may say there is no such thing as religion. There was only Heka, the nearest English equivalent of which is magical power. And this is St. Augustine, who came to Canterbury um, in 590 uh, to bring Catholicism into this country. Uh, it was a Catholic invasion, uh, whichever way you look at it. And he says this, The Christian religion was known to the ancients, nor was wanting at any time from the beginning of the human race until the time when Christ came into flesh whence the true religion, which had previously existed, began to be called Christian. So here we have St. Augustine on the same path as William Blake, which is interesting. And here we have Pope Leo uh, at a different time saying, how well we know what a profitable superstition this fable of Christ has been for us. I found that the great scholars have been priests Catholic priests, Catholic librarians, um, L. W. Morgan, the Reverend, uh, our great historians have been all churchmen. And so it's, it's nice to know that we can quote churchmen on their own subject and get some different views from the mainline themes. Now, this is important, I believe. Neither Jesus nor Muhammad brought a new religion. The many branches of Christianity which have evolved since Jesus' mission in Palestine do not receive support from other important religious groupings on a number of fundamental issues of religious belief and practice. Conflicts continue to cause concern. It's an understatement really, isn't it, when you've got Christians um, and Jews being wiped out at the Arab Spring. The following statements are supported by religious historians, including James Taylor, who I happened to get this quote from and thought about it. Islam insists that neither Jesus nor Muhammad brought a new religion. Both of them sought to call people back to what might be called the Abrahamic faith. And this is the same for the Jews. Very important for the people, um, the Hebrews, and the Judeans, the people of Israel. In contemporary records, both claim to have visited the planted highlands, the Hashemim or heaven, and met Enoch and Gabriel. That's an interesting point, because we have Muhammad saying exactly what Jesus had said. Is that I was in the Garden of Eden talking when Enoch was there. And I leave people to work that one out, um, whether it's um, past lives or, or what. It's an open subject to look at and I take very seriously. And, of course, in terms of Islam, um, Jesus is regarded as a good man, a major prophet, and they've even saved a grave beside him, or beside Muhammad in Mecca, for Jesus on his death after the prophecy of his second coming. Very interesting point. This is a quote from Buddha which is very relevant to the two other Danan, the angels, the shining ones. And he says, follow then the shining ones. And that's another translation of the word deva. Devas, deva, is the shining one in the Hindu. Follow then the shining ones, the wise, the awakened, the loving, for they know how to work and forbear. And then from the Urdu records in the first century AD, we have coins with the image of Buddha and Jesus, minted by a king in Kashmir, which established Jesus as an equal and successor of Buddha. And that is on the video which I put on my leaflet, what I sent round, and the link, um, which is actually on my website. If you go onto my website and go on Jesus Didn't Die on the Cross and, and look at the BBC documentary on that, you'll find that particular video on the same part of um, YouTube. But I was amazingly impressed by that because it was very comprehensive evidence and I've done a lot more research since then and I'm very happy making these statements because I believe they're absolutely spot on. Now the big issues which divide humanity, and this is the Druid quote, um, it really was uh, the truth before the world. 
when Pontius Pilate tried Jesus at his trial, he said four times, four times he heard Jesus' case, he said, what is the truth? And that was the standard question before every Druid legal hearing. Very important. And we're going to talk a little more about Pontius Pilate later on. We have a big difference between our Druid friends and many other people, nearly everybody apart from the Catholic Church, is they believe in free will and one's own choice and enabling one to communicate with God oneself as opposed to original sin. And the concept of original sin was um, you're all sinful, but come to us and pay some money and we'll forgive your sins, which was elaborated to extraordinary lengths in the Middle Ages, and it was the big issue that Martin Luther was concerned about and the reason for uh, the Reformation. And I've said here too, the other interesting thing is the misuse of these words, Jew, Aryan, and Pagan. Um, they're banded around, um, and I'm going to just deal with each of those because I think they're so important that people use the correct words when they're talking about um, issues which can offend or could offend by being effectively wrong or bearing false witness. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And of course, the role of women. So I'll start with free will or original sin. This is, I think, the most important quotation um, that's stuck with me, and that's this. Without freedom of will, there is no humanity. Freedom of conscience was both the birth and breath of manhood. The essence of the soul was will. They've even discovered now, a scientist in nature, that every single living thing requires the ability to act on its own and not be regimented. Being regimented doesn't work. Nature has its own way. And so this was the basic Druid doctrine, which was promoted by the British church under its intellectual leader, Pelagius, Morgan or Morion, and I'm going to come to him later. And he went to Rome in around about 396 and made an enormous number of friends, was fluent in Greek, and won six out of seven court cases. And uh, his court case was rigged at the end of the day, and he was declared a heretic by followers of Augustine of Hippo. Um, and Augustine had insisted upon the Catholic dogma of original sin and divine grace. And I'm going to show you where that comes from, where that, that idea comes from. Now, this is Bangor on Dee, which was a site of a Druidic academy. Um, you won't find conventional churchmen or conventional historians knowing much about this, but all the circumstantial evidence is absolutely amazing. It was destroyed, and monks were killed following the Battle of Chester in AD 16. We're not taught that in our history lessons, unfortunately. The Northumberland king had a big battle with the Welsh kings and the Welsh monks over Christianity, effectively, who was going to uh, have a religion. And I'm afraid the monks of Chester lost tragedy. Now, this was the message of uh, the Pelagian heresy, as it's called and called today, although I know that so many churchmen now realize that it was a mistake and wrong, that Pelagius was actually right. He was the best man we ever had. The Pelagian heresy originated by Morgan or Morion, 20th abbot of Bangor, being in truth nothing else than a revival of Druidism and the old Druidic ideas with regard to the nature and free will of man. Because of his principles and the hostility towards them from those more closely linked with the new religion than Rome, he resigned from Bangor and was sent by a synod at Winchester, which was the capital of Britain at the time, and went aboard with Celestius, who was Irish, representing Irish interests, and they both went to Rome to take on these issues direct with the church authorities in Rome, sent by uh, a synod at Winchester. As well as in Africa, they went to um, Hippo, which is on the north coast of Africa, and Jerusalem. 
and he finally returned to die in his native land after the most eloquent, exemplary, and authoritative attempt to preserve the principle of free will, mankind's primary requirement. And on that point, I could say that the, 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 the natural laws which require the free will of both men and women is a fundamental right of any human being. Pelagius, his Roman name, was born on the same day as his principal opponent on this critical issue, Augustine of Hippo. Augustine successfully promoted the Catholic principle of original sin and divine grace over free will. And he was killed by Arian Christians, people who did not believe in the virgin birth, who believed in the old British religion, and he, they killed him in North Africa. And they were Arian Christian Vandals. We're going to come along to that. And in fact, the Arian, the Vandals from North Africa, uh, a very large percentage of them immigrated to Mercia. But that's another story for another time. It is memorable that Pelagius, when the 20th abbot of Bangor, on receiving an admonition from the bishops of Gaul and Italy, and the Bishop of Rome included, on the latitudinarian nature of his principles, returned it with the observation, Sola in Britannia Ecclesia Britannica Jew. Only in Britain is the British church judged. Quite right. <laughs> Keep it simple. Where did this whole concept of original sin come from? And this is the Secrets of Enoch. It's from the O'Brien's Genius of the Few. And it's about Enoch uh, going to heaven or going to the Hashemim, um, which we're going to come to in a minute, and meet the archangels, angels, and watchers. Wonderfully recorded. All that uh, ties in with the Sumerian records, ties in with the Bible. And this section says this, After this the men brought me to the sixth haven, and there I saw seven groups of angels, very bright and wonderful, with their faces shining brighter than the sun. They were brilliant and all dressed alike and looked alike. Some of these angels study the movements of the stars, the sun and the moon, and record the peaceful order of the world. Other angels there undertake teaching and give instructions in clear and melodious voices. These are the angels who are promoted over the ordinary angels. So these are the archangels who are promoted over the ordinary angels. They are responsible for recording and studying the fauna and flora in both the highlands and the lowlands. There are angels who record the seasons and the years, others who study rivers and the seas, others who study the fruits of the lowlands and plants and herbs which give nourishment to men and beasts. And there are angels studying mankind and record the behavior of men and how they live. Now, Abraham says this. This passage goes even further and provides a rational explanation for the religious concept of the recording angel and the writing down of the good and bad deeds of men. From this account, we can now understand that these angel investigators were only observing mankind from the anthropological point of view, a genetic and um, the, the theological viewpoints. They were not concerned with guilt or original sin, which can now be seen as superimpositions by later misunderstanding religious interpreters. So let's visit heaven and have a good look round. Garden of Eden was located by Abraham um, and Hashem men, that root in there, Shem means seed, it's the planted highlands. It's below, and it's below Mount Hermon and called Karsag, which means head enclosure. Home to the culture bearers, angels and watchers, on the restart of civilization. In the beginning, these are the um, very earliest Sumerian picture signs, um, a cuneiform, um, and it's of an irrigated enclosure or garden, gar, um, and on the right, sag, which is a head. Originally, head was painted, uh, the head was drawn like a head and then turned on its side, and then it revolved into that cuneiform image. So we now have what uh, we're calling the Levantine Corridor Hypothesis. This is for the start of agriculture, start of civilization, but it was a restart by a small group of people who had to survive 
a horrific catastrophe, uh, an ice age for um, 1,500 years, and then a very rapid warming up at the end of the Younger Dryas Ice Age. And we have them choosing this particular location, which was perfect for a number of reasons, and the science all backs this up. The gods chose the Bacar Valley between the snow-capped mountains of Lebanon, close to Mount Hermon, on a south-facing slope, where there was a good supply of snow-melt water, fertile soil, and an ideal location for irrigation agriculture on a lake bed which they had drained. During the Younger Dryas Ice Age, this area was a glacial refuge for important wild grasses, the oak, cedar, pistachio, and olive. They chose a perfect site for the restart of agriculture at the beginning of the Holocene. There is Mount Hermon, there, south of the anti-Lebanon, the Lebanon mountains there. And these were the highlands, and these down here in the Rift Valley, right the way down to uh, the Dead Sea, were the lowlands, which we talk about in the Bible. And here we see the perpetual snow of Mount Hermon, as seen from Mount Bentor in Israel, across the Bekar Rift Valley. Very, very fertile, formerly volcanic, marvellous land, and that snow on the top of those mountains, which is there for six months of a year, was crucial at that point in time to provide vital water for growing crops. And Mount Hermon was called Senia by the Amorites, Sirion by the Sidonians, Baal Hermon by the Canaanites, and also Mount Zion, or S-I-Y-O-N, in the Bible. And in the Arabic, it's called Mountain of the Chief. And was always said to be a place where the sons of God lived. Here we have a remaining cedar grove, well watered by snowmelt water till midsummer. And this was what's left of the great cedar forest. And that's where we find the story of Gilgamesh and Enkidu going to the cedar forest to find the garden of the gods and Enkidu killing Hawawa, who was the great giant who was supposed to guard the cedar forests. And they spoke to the keeper at the gate. If we look at Ezekiel too, we find all the, a number of Ezekiel references to the Garden of Eden being amongst the Lebanon cedars uh, and, and, and the mountains here. Now, in 2007, having read The Genius of the Few, I went to look at Google as soon as they got these fantastic images, which we can all now look at and play around with. And this is the image of what looks like a watercourse. That's how I first saw it. And I thought, whoopee, we've got something here. Uh, there is another view of it. And so right where O'Brien said it was in his book, uh, we could see it now from those aerial photographs. Nobody had a chance of knowing before. Um, and he'd worked that all out from all the records, Enoch's descriptions, a whole range of things, and looked at all the various intermontane basins. And we find that this was a perfect choice, mainly because um, it was possible to control the water table in the basin. And so they controlled the water table over 1,500 acres of land. And this is where we get the stories in the Bible and the Quran of water welling up from the ground. And I haven't got it here, but there's an image of snow covering the basin, and you can see the water coming up from underneath, warmer than the snow on top, proving that point. And we sent, uh, I sent two people out to look at this and survey it, and we're happy that that's spot on as far as O'Brien is concerned. He, he worked it out. And this is the basic story. Everybody's looking for four rivers in Eden, but in fact, it was tr how they translated from the cuneiform uh, the words. And a river went out of Eden, it should have read, a watercourse went out of Eden to water the garden, from whence it was parted, which is sluices, and became into four heads irrigation channels. And so in the original translation, uh, which was thousands of years after the event, uh, they got the word wrong. We have the name of the rivers, it's well known, Paison, Gihon, Hadekal, um, and uh, the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, these names were used much later on, 
and anybody who has a farm knows you always name the fields and name the main water courses and if they're irrigation water courses you tell the chap to go and open the sluice and that one or that one so you name them um, and the text was written after Assyria founded which was about a thousand a thousand uh, BC so it's all there to look at in the detail uh, here you have a bank of that watercourse, another bank there, and the watercourse, that's been bulldozed away. It's being damaged and filled in uh, to make little reservoirs and for them to grow fruit trees along the length of the watercourse. That's the view from Enil's great house. In Sumer it was called the Eker Mountain House, but there you can see the 1,200, 1,500 acres of beautiful soil in the bottom of that drained lake bed. Um, and on the slope just below us here there is a well um, here, you see the well um, of extraordinary water systems in operation and this is where um, they would have had livestock and orchards and planting trees and a whole operation and this whole operation was running for something like from 9,500 9 BC to 6,500 BC over 3,000 years and here is the site of the great house. It's on a, um, it's perched on a high rock. That's how it's described, and that's exactly what you've got. That is on the top of a high rock, and there's a lot of um, debris around the top there, which has been bulldozed to the sides, which look like the original stone structures of fireplaces and very ancient uh, stonework. A little more description, and I'll read it out. This is a flat top hill overlooking the north and south Rishaya basins. A perfect site, wonderful views of Mount Hermon. The site of Enil's great cedar built house and enclosure on the high rock. Various descriptions from the ancient text are clear in providing the evidence we're looking here at the Eker mountain house, where the gods lived and divine decrees were given. Kingship was exercised and from which the cosmic waters of fertility flow. Descriptions of the great cedar built house within the sanctuary with the building of stone fireplaces and where Adam and Eve spoke to the serpent all helped to support the Abraham thesis that this is the site of the Garden of Eden. And of course the serpent wasn't a snake, the serpent was a wise man or a wise woman. And that's another big issue which I'm going to touch on later. So now we switch on to another subject, the truth about the Jews. There is no homogeneous Jewish people who came from a genetic group separate from all other people. Their lost tribes and the Bible narratives are an affront to reality or mere propaganda that became managed by Rome. There were no lost tribes. The tribes were never lost. They knew exactly where they were going. And they came from the same area and they had intermarried over a thousand of years. The Holocaust, including the brothers of the Jews, Ukrainians, Armenians, and Irish, etc. In the 20th century, the attempted genocide of the Jewish people also happened to the Ukrainian people under Stalin. The most important thing about the Jewish religion and beliefs are that it's the oldest and it's based on the truth, and it's very important. And okay, it's called the Abrahamic faith along with Islam and Christianity. But one interesting feature is the final act at the end of the week, the congregation turns around and face the back of the synagogue and pay their respects to what they call the Earth Mother Goddess, um, which is, of course, um, if you've read the Abraham material, the Lady Ninkar said, wife of Enil, key lady, evidence of historical truth. And the other important thing, of course, is that the Jews did not kill Jesus for which Jews have been persecuted ever since he was supposed to have been killed by the Jews. Palestine, a consequence of misunderstandings and racism. We have all the things about the promised land, etc., etc., and we know the Bible stories. And I spoke to a group of Palestinians outside the House of Lords, and rather foolishly perhaps said, how about it if the Americans stop giving aid to Israel on the basis that you lived Arab Jew, Arab Jew, Arab Jew in the housing and accommodation throughout the area. And the reply I got was, that's how it used to be. 
and that, of course, is a great tragedy. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, we're worrying about nuclear war. We're worrying about more fighting, uh, immense suffering. Uh, our social organization has collapsed in so many ways. Now, the truth about the Aryans, the Aryan simply means the noble ones. They didn't come out of the steppes. They came from the same place, the land of Canaan. The Tuapadanan, the red-haired ones, the people of Dan, the tribe of Dan. The Aryan fiction, though, was used by political forces to create a war. Pagan. Pagan means pays. Pagan. Peasant. Peasant. So the church said, you're a peasant if you didn't come to church. And it was a way in which pagan was, and still is used, as a derogatory term against all those who do not follow the Christian church establishment. Role of women. In about AD 180, Bishop Clement of Alexandria, a prominent father of the church, had declared, men and women share equally in perfection and are to receive the same instruction and the same discipline. For the word humanity applies equally to both men and women. And for us in Christ there is neither male nor female. In justification of his words, Clement listed a number of women who have been significant in the past history, especially in terms of academic learning. His view was widely supported by a contemporary educated society. Even so, the Pope, Pope later ruled that Clement had been in error. It was declared with thunderous authority that a woman cannot be a priest because our Lord was a man. That's what happens to little girls when they're dying in the Saddam. A vulture purchased behind a young girl who's dying of hunger in the Saddam. Very, very tragic story, but hard-hitting in terms of our respect for one another and how life has deteriorated. And I like to say a kind word for the vulture. The vulture won't actually start eating a little girl until the girl is dead, which is interesting point from the wildlife point of view. But what a tragedy. And this photographer committed suicide the following year. More than 800,000 young African children died here of malaria, missing out on a medicinal cure that costs less than 50p each. The veil they cannot lift. This is the Taliban in 2004. Certainly not what Muhammad intended. Muhammad's wife was a very successful businesswoman. She was a Hanif, which is very close to being a Kafar, perfect one, as Abraham was supposed to be. Um, his wife, uh, Muhammad's wife's sister was also a Hanif. Um, Muhammad relied very firmly on women to support him at Medina. They were always there from the start, playing an equal role to men, as all women did in the ancient world. What have we done? What has happened in the name of Muhammad and Islam since? Well, I know it's very different between the different uh, Sufis, for example, are also very close to Druids and very so to Cathars. And it's a wide spectrum. But it's so sad that that wide spectrum, that spectrum uh, covers so much suffering. And also I'll say this, we have fantastic competent Muslims living in Britain. Our British Muslim community is of a highest order, and I would put it higher than our Church of England and our Catholic Church, in my personal experience, in terms of common sense, in terms of uh, giving people a clear message on how to live. So it's a very mixed bag. You saw the veil still being used. You know the fuss in France about the veil. Well, this is Shah Reza, freeing women from the Iran from the veil in 1936. The war interrupted so much, and Shah Reza found himself on the wrong side, or in the wrong position, because he had oil which everybody wanted, Russia and Germany. But another tragic factor of history. But you can see all the ladies dressed up in the most marvellous hats and clothes. Switching back to Britain. St. Paul came to Britain right about 60 AD. He had two years, three years after he was shipwrecked where he disappeared from the scene and it's thought that he got another ship uh, in Malta and went to Spain and um, came across France into Britain. 
On arriving in Britain, Paul headed straight for Bangor on Dee, which is what I showed you earlier, one of the four most important Druidic academies, along with Nantwick Major, Glastonbury and Old Sarum. Was he following Jesus? My view is that there's a very good case that that was. Um, it always was the monastery of all monasteries. It was always extremely important. And I'm willing to bet that Jesus spent time at uh, Bangor on Dee, and that's the reason Paul went straight there. St. Paul, liberated from his first captivity in Rome, left to preach the gospel to the Britons and others in the West, testified by Theodoretus in 435 AD. In Britain, he headed for the primary Druidic college at what became known as the Great Abbey at Bangor Isikoed, beside the Druid's sacred river Dee. The foundation of the abbey was assigned by tradition to St. Paul. Its primary language would have been Greek. Its discipline and doctrine was certainly known as the rule of Paul. Paul I regular. And over each of the four gates was engraved his precept, If a man will not work, neither let him eat. Its abbots regarded themselves as his successors. They were always men of the highest grade in society, and generally of royal blood. I'm going to come to this royal blood thing, because it's quite interesting. Termed the mother of all monasteries by St. Hilary and St. Benedict, Bede and other authors state the number of monks in it at 2,100, and scholars amounting to many thousands. By contrast, the first Egyptian monastery was said to be founded by Pachomius in 360 AD. Still going strong, and remember Pelagius, who I spoke about earlier, was the 22nd abbot of Bangor on Dee. Now we're looking at vital clues to the nature of early Christian teaching. Very important man, Hugh McGregor Ross, who is a leading specialist on St. Thomas. And he told me that in St. Catherine's Monastery, at the foot of Mount Sinai, and he wanted me to go and look to prove it, but it was proved quite a task to be able to do that. But in the oldest version uh, of the Acts of Thomas, which is in the St. Catherine's Monastery Library in Sinai, states clearly that Jesus was having regular meetings with Thomas in India after the crucifixion. Now, the translation done in about 1904 by a Christian priest, um, he, Christian priest translated it he, that Thomas was having regular visions of Jesus, but on checking the wording, it wasn't visions, he was actually having meetings. But I don't think the Christian um, uh, priest could have done it any other way, probably, because he would have been in trouble if he'd said something like that. Anyway, the first Christian Syrian or Syriac church in India was founded by Thomas in Kerala, southwest India, in AD 52. That's before Glastonbury and any other churches, other than the one in Rome. Before the, and that was before the Caractacus family returned from exile in Rome to found churches at Lanillid, AD 63, and Glastonbury, AD 65. And this is extraordinary. Britain's King Alfred sent an embassy to Kerala in AD 883, headed by Sighelm, Bishop of Sherborne, to visit the tomb of Thomas in what has now become the most Christian state in India. The Syrian church remains today wonderfully integrated in its social customs with the surrounding Hinduism. Another very important a specialist called Jeff Crandall, who makes the point about the Gospel of Thomas. Um, and he says here, And unlike the others, Thomas does not present a plot, a crucifixion, resurrection, miracles, or apocalyptic warnings. In fact, Thomas rejects these notions and instead focuses on the mystical transformation of each individual, a theme aligned to work more closely with Buddhism than surviving Christian religion. So surprisingly, many scholars now argue that Thomas preserves Thomas preserves the most primitive versions of many of Jesus' sayings. Very important link in this whole story. You see, we're putting together pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. Now, this is um, Christian O'Brien's work, Path of Light. The book is outside. It's Christian O'Brien's translation of what were always considered the two most important Gnostic documents, 
before the Nag Hammadi find. And they're what's called the Askew and Bruce Codices, which were found in Lower Egypt. Um, and they're primary sources on the spoken words of Jesus. What makes them so special is that they were recorded and witnessed by the disciple scribes Matthew, Philip and Thomas, which was what you did under the Hebraic law of the time with an authoritative and important document. Now, a brown scholarly secular approach reveals the path of light as a treatise on spiritual truths taught in the Druidic, mystery and brotherhood schools of the ancient world and by Valentinus, right about 120 AD. And Valentinius nearly became Pope. The original documents from which the codices were copied would have been prize records of the Arian Christians in Alexandria and their bishop, George of Lydia. St. George, most popular man in the Mediterranean, was the bishop of Alexandria, appointed by Arius. Alexandria being second in importance to Rome at the time of George's beheading in AD 361 under the persecution of the Catholics and Arians under Emperor Julian the Apostate. Julian the Apostate lasted about two or three years before he was killed fighting. The real problems came with Emperor Theodosius, and I'm going to come to him a little bit later. In AD 391, Emperor Theodosius instructed George's successor, appointed by him, Catholic Bishop Theophilus, to fire and destroy the Seraphim Library, one of the great crimes against humanity. Jesus was teaching advanced knowledge of Surat Shabbat Yoga, Soul Word Union, to his inner circle of disciples, who consisted of men and women after the crucifixion. Great weight of evidence. Now back to the great historians. This man lived, um, he was um, 83, certainly was 10 years after Jesus was born, and Susa or Susiana was a, a, a wonderful city, a very sophisticated city which paralleled Babylon. And this is what, what he tells us. This is the history. The Phoenicians. Upon the Tessurian Sea, the people live who style themselves Phoenicians. These were the great first founders of the world, founders of cities and of mighty states, who showed a path through seas before unknown. In the first ages, when the sons of men knew not which way to turn them, they assigned to each his first department they bestowed, of land a portion, of sea a lot, and sent each wandering tribe far off to share a different soil and climate. Hence arose the great diversity so plainly seen, mid nations widely severed. And the Tessurian Sea, or the Syrian Sea, of of course the Mediterranean, and it's called the Tyrrhenian Sea um, on the uh, west coast of Italy, at the time of the Etruscans. The key point there is they bestowed of land a portion. Anybody arriving in Britain up to the Druid times would have been entitled to three acres of land or five acres of land, depending on the quality of land, and free passage through the country. There was a massive flow of people backwards and forwards. The Druids held meetings back in the old homelands, and so did the kings every year. And even those who crossed the Pacific used to sail their double canoes back to um, the Melanesian islands and had regular council meetings in the same way that they were doing it in Sumer. And the system was based on kingship and the kings would meet in council and when there was a problem they would appoint a king of kings. And in Sumer it was called a shushak he was king of kings, Ozymandias in Greece, Bradward in Saxon, and a pen dragon uh, in Britain. And so <coughs> Caractacus was a pen dragon in times of trouble, and then Bodicea, a woman, was given the job as pen dragon after the revolt or the Bodicean War. Here are the kingdoms of Israel and Judah in 926 BC. Very, very big, very, very important area. And you'll see the Philistines small area uh, here, and you'll see the 
uh, Phoenicians there. But this is where um, these were the homelands of the ancestors of most British people. A may surprise one. Um, L.A. Waddle is the great specialist. All the genetic research now done shows this. It also shows that the people living in the land of Canaan have been there for 8,000 years, 9,000 years, which includes the Canaanites and also the Phoenicians. Massive movements, backwards and forwards, of course. Now let's look at Britain around the time of the Roman invasions from Caesar's invasion in 55 BC, which was unsuccessful. He was beaten off and went back. Here you have a big area of land, which is the Cymru, right the way to Yorkshire. That area of land was laid waste by cometary debris in about 600 BC. And after it had been laid waste, um, it was somewhere where a lot of people could go and settle um, because the land was free and open. And this is where we get the big migration of the um, ancestors of the Welsh here coming into that area. Um, Albin, it's called in Scotland. Um, and you've got the various tribes, which most people know about. But around the birth of Christ, the inhabitants of Britain were known racially as Cimmerian, historic racial name for the Celts. Cymru remains the Welsh Cymru, originating from King Omri, founder of Samaria, capital of Israel. The Good Samaritans, remember. In Celtic, Cymru, still pronounced Cymru. Celtoi, Celt, the letter C, uh, substitute the other K in the spelling of the name, but the pronunciation is the same. Native tribal variations took on a different enunciation and spelling. The Celts, the inhabitants of England and Wales, uh, Celts, the inhabitants of Hibernia, Ireland, Gaels, the inhabitants of Scotland, and Gallic, the people of Gaul, now France. Now, ethnically, they're all the same people. Meaning of the word in each case is stranger indicating that the Celt and the Gael and the Gaul were all strangers in the land in which they dwelt, not an Aborigine, as some people would have us suppose. So let's look at the apostles. What was happening after Jesus' crucifixion, or the date when they, he was um, on the cross, taken down from the cross, clearly didn't die. Clearly I was busy back at work again within weeks. Um, and we see that from the path of light and many other sources. I won't go into that because it's, it's, it's the alternative view and it's a very important alternative view. People don't rise, rise from the dead. Um, it was an expression of somebody who'd been excommunicated um, in the Druid language and they rise from the dead um, when they're now back or forgiven or pardoned. The first apostle among the apostles credited with visiting Britain in the first century was Simon Zelotes, one of the original twelve. Very important figure, and uh, a lot of write-ups, there's lots to say about him and very good references. Um, and uh, he preached Christ through all Mauritania and Africa. Uh, the less, that's, uh, Africa, the less is uh, the areas, North, North Africa, Egypt, etc. He was crucified in Britannia, slain and buried. Now, Astrolobus also came to Britain, and they're coming literally, as uh, far as they could get to England was after the crucifixion. They're here, they're doing things in Britain. And the fact that they were rushing back to Britain, as far as I'm concerned, is evidence that Britain was involved in the whole project of Jesus being in Palestine. Now, Astrolobus was the exiled brother of King Herod Agrippa, so he was a, a, a key member of a royal family, of the elite. Uh, very important. And he also was eventually um, killed. Um, a second reference there, uh, Astrolobus is away in Britain. Now I'm not going to read all these out because you can have a DVD and you can look at it on YouTube and stop it and read it all later on. But all these are reference points that this man was in Britain. Philip, another key figure, um, Matthew Thomas and Philip were the uh, authors and scribes who wrote and put everything together for the Askew and Bruce, Bruce Curtises. And he almost certainly 
being so close in France, um, it, it makes no sense for him not to have come to Britain at the time. He also was um, the author, probable author, of the Gospel of Philip. Um, and may well have authored the Gospel of Mary Magdalene because he spent so much time in France with Mary Magdalene. So now we get on to James, the brother of Jesus. This is about Jesus and his brother, James, in Britain with the Druids. Now, he's called Arimathea, but many people have picked up the point that that was a title. There's no place called Arimathea, and the title was Haramathea, which means crown prince. And that's very important, because if Joseph, uh, the younger brother of Jesus, was a crown prince, what did it make Jesus? It made Jesus Christ, and Christ means king. That's something that we're going to look at and touch upon. And it's also called James the Just, Misunderstanding caused by the apparent anomalies and duplicated entries concerning Joseph, Haram, Theo, and James the Just in Britain, Gaul, and Spain provoked some argument between the bishops of the Council of Baal in 1434. As a result, individual countries decided to follow their different traditions. It is St. Joseph who is most remembered in connection with church history in Britain, whereas it is St. James uh, uh, that he is revered in Spain. And of course, Joseph Haramathea or Amarathea appears in all the Gospels, and there is an enormous quantity of material about him, key figure. Even so, the English authorities compromised when linking him with the nation's monarchy, and the royal court, of, the royal court in London became the Palace of St. James. This primary residence of England's royalty was built in 1531-36 to on the site of a hospital for leprous women, as established by the 12th century Glastonbury benefactor, King Henry II, which had also been dedicated to St. James. And the feasts observed at the foundation were those of St. James and St. Dunstan. James, Joseph, um, I'm calling him Joseph James. Um, I hope that point's made. Um, and here are all the references, and no better reference than Cardinal Cesare Baronius in his 601 Annales Ecclesiasticae, the Vatican librarian, recorded that Joseph Arimathea first came from our sales in AD 35, nine years before the Magdalene voyage. From there, he and his company crossed to Britain. It was confirmed long before by Gildas Baronicus in his De Exilio Britanniae, with earlier references by Eusebius of Caesarea and Hilaire Poitier, in the years 35-37, very shortly after the crucifixion, are thus among the earliest recorded dates for Nazarene evangelism in Britain. I'm going to come back more to uh, Cardinal Baronius. Now, on their arrival in the west of England, Joseph and his twelve missionaries were apparently viewed with scepticism by the native Britons, but were greeted with some cordiality by King Arivagus of Soluria, brother of Tractus and the Pendragon. In consultation with other local chiefs, Arivagus granted Joseph a party twelve hides of Glastonbury land, about 1,440 acres. Here in AD 63-64, um, later, of course, they built the unique little church on the scale of the ancient tabernacle of Moses. These grants, of jo grants to Joseph remained holdings of free land for many centuries thereafter and were confirmed in the Doomsday Book of 1086. Church of Glastonbury has its own veal, 12 hides of land, which have never paid tax. This is incredibly well recorded. It's a story that appears time and time again in the record books. This is a book on the whole subject of the legendary 12 hides by Ray Gibbs, which is very interesting. One hide is usually 120 acres, but in some sets 160, because the land isn't quite so good. There's a bit of marsh in there. Now, this is the key to the whole thing, and I've discussed this at length with Lawrence Gardner. The only people who were offered a hide of land, that much land, were qualified druids. It was the prize for doing 20 years or the equivalent work on the specialist subject. And it must show 
how much reverence there was for Jesus himself, that those who had been taught the advanced mysteries by Jesus after the crucifixion uh, were considered in such, uh, such high status, and that party of 12 were awarded uh, a hide of land each when they arrived. I think that's conclusive evidence. Many other people have picked that point up. There's Glastonbury, as you can see here, 700 BC. You could bring all the ships in on the tide to get the silver from the lead. And remember, the Mendips were famous for the lead mines, and the, up to 20% of the lead contained silver, and it was very easy to extract. It was one place the Romans wanted to get to when they arrived. So that tradition of coming here. And of course, you can slip across the Bristol Channel to all the mining resources in South Wales, in Siluria, where the Cymru were firmly based. Very important. And you can see by 260 AD, uh, this land is rising. In fact, London sinking, and uh, you're seeing more land. And if you go there now, you can walk across it without much difficulty. But the old river brew and the river system would have allowed the boats come up on the tide to uh, Street Bridge um, and pr provide a very good communication to get to Glastonbury. In addition to the accounts of Joseph of Arimathea in Glastonbury, others tell of his, his association with Gaul and the Mediterranean metal trade. Abbot John of Glastonbury, um, I'm, I'm going to miss that, they were both quoted from a book found by Emperor Theodosius at the Praetorium in Jerusalem entitled De Sancto of Arimathea it tells how Joseph was imprisoned by the Jewish elders after the crucifixion. This event is also described in the Acts of Pilate section of the Gospel of Nicodemus. And there's also the story that James was killed or stoned. Um, and in the Gnostic records, he um, may have, have appeared to have been killed, but they say that he escaped and was not killed at that particular incident. And he was, a very, he was a very rich man. It's very important to realize that he was, um, he was the heir to the throne, so to speak. And he was an incredibly rich man. The family had been involved in the minerals industry for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And I'm going to get touch on that. Lawrence says here in his original work, he thought that the land grant by King Aravagus was because of Joseph of Aramidia's mining interests. And I put it here. He was, after all, a well-known metal merchant, an artificer of metals, a master craftsman, Hope Tecton, uh, as was his father in the tradition of the Old Testament characters, Tubal Cain and Bezal Eel. Joseph James was described as immensely wealthy, great lord, and Roman-appointed noble de Curio, responsible for supplying metals to the Roman Empire. Well, he wouldn't have a a brother, an elder brother who was lesser than him. He had an elder brother who was far more important than him. <laughs> That's my argument. Anyway, Lawrence, before he died, supported um, and thought that was, you know, really made sense that that grant of land was for qualified druids. That just tells you what they were doing, you know, 1900 to 1600 BC, <clears throat> British Museum, a thousand wonderful objects. Um, a mould gold cape found near the Great Orm Copper Mine in North Wales. That kind of quality. This will interest you too. This is a letter between Charles Hapgood um, and John Dolphin. They've been in correspondence about uh, the incredible fact that pure gold had been found in articles attributed to the Phoenicians. And to obtain pure gold, it is necessary to reach a temperature of 6,000 degrees centigrade. And that was something like five or 6,000 BC. So the degree of sophistication and technology in the land of Canaan or the, amongst the Phoenicians was incredible. And these letters, series of letters, go on to talk about monatomic elements um, and uh, the whole science um, of um, uh, powdered gold, for example. Um, and these came to me, not from Lawrence Gardner, but from uh, Bernard Delaire, another source. Copper cake, wonderful gold coins from the Veneti, or Venite in Brittany, 
fifth, the first century BC. And I'm showing these because these people on the Brittany coast were crucial to this whole debate. They had been with their fantastic ships, which the Romans couldn't compete with, had been providing arms and provisions and food and resources and soldiers from the docks in Cardiff, where the Silluries lived, to the Gauls in France. And the reason, main reason for invading Britain is because they weren't winning in Gaul and they needed to be able to cut off the Gaul, the, the, the supply uh, of um, all the things the Gauls needed to defend themselves against the Romans. Key factor in this whole extraordinary story. And there's the map, the Gallic people in modern Britain, and it's that um, uh, light green uh, near the coast here where the Venici lived. Now, they were a seafaring people who lived in the Brittany Peninsula, which the Roman times formed part of an area called Amorica. America? They gave their name to the modern city of Vain, which was believed to be their capital. The Veneti built their ships of oak with large transoms fixed with iron nails of thumb, a thumb's thickness. They navigated and powered their ships with the use of leather sails. This made their ship strong, sturdy, and structurally sound, capable of withstanding the harsh conditions of the Atlantic. And let's say they brought supplies to the Gauls during the Roman War from Cardiff's Old Harbour, and probably other harbours around Britain. That's the scale of copper and bronze working. Um, you've got tin Cornwall, vital, tin here, and tin there, not much anywhere else. And tin was crucial for mixing with the copper uh, for bronze. And we see this in, in certainly 2,500 BC. Uh, or Great Orm Mine is certainly 2,500 BC. So th the British had a lot to offer the Mediterranean and was a wonderful place to come climate-wise, farming-wise, and every otherwise, rich in metals and resources. Now, the historian Gregory of Tours also mentioned the imprisonment of Joseph in his History of the Franks, and it was recounted yet again in Joseph Arimathea by the Burgundian Grail Chronicler, Sir Robert de Boron in the 12th century. The Magna Glastonius Tabula and other manuscripts add that Joseph subsequently escaped and was pardoned. Some years later, he was in Gaul with his nephew Josephus, who was baptized by Philip the Apostle. Now, this may stretch some people's imagination, but I'm going to do some stretching now. One thing that people didn't destroy was their family trees. And the one thing that has been able to be properly checked are family records, family histories. And here we have the three children of Mary Magdalene, and they're here. Tamar, the elder daughter, born AD 33. And Jesus was 40. Jesus too, and his younger brother Josephus, who was described as Har Ramathia, as he was the second son. And the tradition was the elder son was called Jesus, and the second son was called Josephus. So we're back to this business of Jesus and Joseph. Lots of other links there which are important, but I won't deal with them just for the moment. But we had intermarriage between Joseph of Arimathea's family and Jesus' family, going back a long while, in my opinion. Joseph of Arimathea died aged 81 in 82. Now, Jesus would have been 89 at that time. And we're talking about him being an uncle. Now, it's unlikely that a man who's younger than Jesus is going to be an uncle. It's another very important thing. And going through all the uh, dates and the ages and checking everything, it seems perfectly clear that Joseph of Arimathea was not the uncle of Jesus. He was a brother. Another very important point. And this is reliable evidence that he, when he was died, and um, after I had buried the Christ, I came to the hours of the West. I taught, I entered my rest. I put in there quite deliberately, was Joseph of Arimathea in India? And it wouldn't surprise me one little bit if he'd gone to India. He was a great sailor, he had a fleet of ships, he was travelling the world, he was going to Gaul, France, Spain, the whole of the Roman Empire, 
I wouldn't be surprised if he went and go to India, even if he were just looking for sources of metals. Uh, Joseph James became the principal teacher of Christianity for the Canberra Britons. That was sort of the church view afterwards, which is probably true. He was a great teacher. Um, more references. Um, Ina, king of the country, raised a large church over his grave. Um, we find all the veneration of Joseph at Glastonbury. I had a wonderful book by the Reverend C. Dobson, Did Our Lord Visit Britain, as they say in Cornwall and Somerset. And the Reverend Lewis also wrote some wonderful books and material. Let's look at a 14th century window of St. John the Baptist Church in Glastonbury. And here we have Joseph Astrolopus, Simon Zelotes, King Aravacus. They wouldn't be up in, up in stained glass windows if they hadn't played a role or been involved, it's my, my view. But it's just another, another more added interest and added evidence. And there's the church of St. John the Baptist at Glastonbury. The ch old church at Glastonbury um, was called the Vetusta Ecclesia um, and was cited in royal charters. I think most people know about the histories there. And so it was a very important uh, structure and building. And there's a symbol of the fish, which was the um, Vesica Pisces. Um, and it was a glyph which is described here as symbolizing his message, a divine partnership between male and female that led to the innermost mysteries. As we can see, a message was severely subverted and suppressed by the Orthodox Church. There's a picture of the old original Wattle Church. And there is that um, photograph there of the, uh, what remains of the, uh, the abbey um, that was built over that where the Wattle Church stood. And it was dedicated to Mary Magdalene uh, in AD 64, which is the year after she died. It was thought it was dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, but a whole reason, number of reasons which are clear in Lawrence's books. Um, it was dedicated to Mary Magdalene. And the great monastery was subsequently added. And Glastonbury uh, Monastery uh, was second in size and importance only to Westminster Abbey in London. I put in, we mentioned Mary Magdalene, and this is a picture of the ruins of the great synagogue at Capernaum, which was governed by Mary Magdalene's father, the Jairus priest, Cyrus. We have the capture now of Caradoc, as he was called in Britain, and Caractacus during the Roman Wars. Despite periods of peace with the Romans and intermarriage between the opposing families, Rome sent practically everything they had against the Britons. For seven years the war went on, sometimes in Rome's favour, sometimes in Britain's, but overall Rome was making little progress in trying to possess the southern portion of Britain. And Caradoc's brother, Arivagus, was a brilliant general and they kept fighting and wore the Romans down. But Caradoc was betrayed um, by a relation <laughs> and taken to Rome in chains where millions of Romans gathered to see the famous British warrior paraded to Caesar. And Caradoc gave his famous speech delivered before the Emperor's Tribunal as follows. This is Tacitus reports the speech, Caradoc's speech, to the Senate as follows. Had my government in Britain been directly, solely, with a view to the preservation of my hereditary domains or the aggrandizement of my own family, I might long since have entered the city an ally, not a prisoner. Nor would you have disdained for a friend, a king, descended from illustrious ancestors and the dictator of many nations. My present condition, stripped of its former majesty, is as adverse to myself as is the cause of triumph to you. What then? I was lord of men, horses, arms, and wealth. What wonder if at your dictation I refused to resign them? Does it follow that because the Romans aspire to universal dominion, every nation is to accept the vassalage they would impose? I am now in your power, betrayed, not conquered, had I, like others, yielded without resistance, where would have been the name of Caradoc? Where your glory? Oblivion would have buried both in the same tomb. Bid me live. I shall survive forever in history. 
one example at least of Roman clemency. Not a bad speech. And following seven years of exile, a family in Rome from AD 53, the British palace became the refuge and meeting point for early Christians. And they was given palace, property, everything. Remember, the families had all intermarried, and they'd been intermarrying for the previous four or five hundred years. It's very important to realize that the royal links were very, very important to people. And the whole system of kingship was so different from what we've had it in the last 2,000 years. And that, what still remains today, you can go and visit it. It's all that's left of the British palace, but it's a fantastic church of San Prudentia, where um, the granddaughters of Caractacus, Prudentia and Praxedes, uh, entertained the Christians, looked after the Christians. Paul went there. Unbelievable story. And, of course, they both suffered martyrdom after giving sanctuary to those in danger. Lanillid. Very interesting story. This is the little village um, off the M4, not far from um, Cardiff. And you have the recent church built on the site of the old church, which was dedicated by Urgain, the younger daughter of Garadoc, and Joseph Haramathia, whose name in Welsh was Iliad. And believe it or not, you can walk from that site and find both coal and iron deposits right where you would expect them to put it. And on the right is the remains of a fantastic manor house, which would have been the accommodation which they would have lived in at that particular time, very important site. And that was in 62 AD, two years before the Glastonbury Church. So looking at royal family trees, this royal connection is really interesting, gets really exciting. Now we talk about Brutus. Brutus is supposed to have come to Totnes and is supposed to have come from Troy. That all the searching here, it doesn't make sense for Brutus to have come from, uh, he may have come from Troy, but certainly he didn't come at 1074. It's far more likely it was about 600 BC. And that's the detailed work from Gilbert Wilson and Brackett, among other people. This is to support the whole concept of people immigrating from at the end of the Mediterranean, from the eastern Mediterranean, and from the area of Troy, for example. The identity of the Cymri or Cumbers with the Sumers, suggested by my discovery in various ancient mining centres in Britain, and especially the land of the Cymri or Cumbers, of several scribblings of the old Sumerian script of Babylonia, see later, is confirmed by the findings that Sumerian is the basis of British or English language. In the previous lectures, I've shown a hundred words which are the same in British now, English now, as they were in Sumerian, of which we will find many further instances, incidentally, as we proceed. It is also confirmed by the Welsh Cymru traditional account on the arrival of King Brut, Barat or Prydain, who is the same person as Brutus, as his name is dialectically spelt in Welsh and Britain, as found in the Welsh triads. So this looking in the Welsh triads is crucial. And what most Oxford and Cambridge academics don't do is they consider the Welsh triads nonsense and won't look at it. And it's also confirmation of an altogether independent source, the tradition preserved in the chronicles of Nennius and Geoffrey. The sixth triad, the Welsh triad, says that first Hugh Gadan originally conducted the nation of Cymru to the Isle of Britain that came from the summer county, which is called Defabania, is over the hazy sea, eastern Mediterranean. And Homer uses hazy, hazy or misty sea in the Iliad. They came to the Isle of Britain and to Lidor, which may be London or the south coast. Now, Hugh Gadarn is the Welsh god of agriculture, and I believe that Hugh Gadarn was the same person as Enil, which is a title, senior title, of the Sumerians and the people going way back to the original Karsak settlement. This is a tablet found at Smyrna, close to Troy, uh, by E.A. Hoffman, which is the very earliest, this is 4000 BC, very earliest picture writing, Sumerian picture writing, just to show the links from Sumeria to Troy, and later on eventually uh, to Britain. Now the first convert, we're told, was Arch Druid Bran, and I put Cymbeline or Jesus. He was definitely Cymbeline. 
And many people have said or suggested that Cymbeline and Jesus were one and the same. And I'll tell you why. Cymbeline, or Jesus, is the father of Caractacus. All the dates work out. Going back to Brutus and following his bloodline through his son Cambria, it brings us to Bran van Digiad. Bran was the king of the West Silures. He stepped down as king to become Archdruid. This so often happened with the king, when the king reached a certain age of maturity, he would become an Archdruid or go into learning and teaching. It's rather like going to the House of Lords. But the young king, who was fit and very uh, and could really run around the country and did the job. And his son, his son Caradoc, then became king of Siluria. Now, Francis Bacon and other scholars believe that this father of Cracticus, Simeon or Jesus, and we're seeing a situation where Jesus went um, and was in Britain at the age of 16, and he married at the age of 18, 19, a royal marriage. And because he was the son of, uh, 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 he was eligible for kingship in uh, his homeland or the homeland of the British people, he was also on the same line um, as the British kings and had as much status amongst the British kings to be a king as anyone else. Very important point. And we see this with the descent of Brutus and the close family links to Aeneas, the founder of Rome. Here we have Aeneas, and we've got the Roman uh, Caesars going down that line, and we've got the British kings going down this line with Brutus on it. That point may well be proved at some point in time. Is this something that can be proved, I believe? But it all fits the whole picture. And there's our King Arch, Cymbeline, and his sons, or a daughter and two sons. She married Aulus Plautus, the Roman emperor. They did the business of marrying off daughters to the enemy so they could make peace. That was the idea, or hold peace. They ended up by in-laws fighting, but that's another story. <laughs> and then Caradoc's children, uh, Silenius, Sinon. Uh, Linnaeus became the first bishop of Rome. St. Ergain married Salog, who was lord of Salisbury, a Roman uh, a, a very important Roman figure. Um, and and Glad Gladys married Rufus Pudens, who had been based at Chichester. And these were the three who, uh, the rest of the children here, these two were uh, martyred. And here we have Joseph of Arimathea and Jesus. And we've got cross links further down. Um, and so you can go all the way through to Constantine and show the family links. And I wouldn't be surprised if a number of people here can trace their bloodlines back to the same thing if you look at the population dynamics. Again, there, and you've got the Merovingians, and this is Jesus' grandson here, marrying back into this family here. I mean, of doubt. So look at Jesus now. He had a lot of brothers, a uh, big family, two sisters. Um, they were all there, key figures right from the start within all the various documents. Very important. Jesus is supposed to have landed in England according to the Jesus in Cornwall tradition. Now, that's we don't can't prove that, but there are a number of points that raise that issue. Um, and this is from the Nazarenes Com. A very good website on a lot of these details. Jesus was a stranger in Judea, um, later described as a traveler in Kashmir. And this was the fact that when he arrived back in Judea, uh, they didn't really know who he was, didn't recognize him. He was a stranger to them. The people could not refer to him by name, but only his relationship to other members of his family whose identity was not in doubt. Now, this is the letter from Pope Gregory to St. Augustine. It states that there was a church um, constructed by no human art, and they've suggested this was Jesus um, at, at, um, uh, at Glastonbury. Um, and William of Malmesbury includes it in his writings, uh, the contents of a letter given by King Enid. That we have a number of linking claims that Jesus was in Glastonbury. 
Remember, it could have been Jesus, his son. It could have been his uh, second son. That's the sort of building it would have built in the Lake Village. William Blake, we all know, did those feet in ancient time um, and the satanic mills and the story there. A little more of a clue. A very good evidence of Jesus and Mary in Scotland. And Barry Dunford has done some fantastic work of Scotland being of great importance from the point of view of Druid academies and uh, activity and evidence of uh, Jesus and Mary, a uh, Magdalene that is, in Scotland. We certainly know that Christ, the true Son, afforded his light and knowledge of these precepts to our Ireland in the last reign of Tiberius Caesar. This is Gildas. A Greek and Roman testimony states that the noble and wealthy of Rome and other nations right round the Mediterranean sent their children to study law, science and religion in Britain. Another very important clue. Jesus had been on the line of David had been an extremely important royal figure, then he would have been almost certainly sent to England. And, you know, this is uh, an, another um, reference here. Among the Great White Brotherhood, it's recorded that after Jesus graduated from Mount Carmel, he travelled to Britain to study. He would have been about 15 at the time, and British legends tell us this is when he first began to study with the Druids. Again, Glastonbury. Life of Rabbi Jesus by Tony Busby. He was called a rabbi, um, or great teacher, um, master of righteousness, teacher of righteousness. And here it's uh, very clear from this particular reference that uh, Jesus received his religious education into the secret orders of the Essene, the Essene were Druids, uh, Pythagoreans were Druids, and the records of antiquity reveal that they were associated with affiliate communities. Those records also insist that Jesus spent time as a youth in Druidic communities in Britain and was there with Joseph of Arimathea. So Jesus and James were in Britain. Jesus' grandfather, Roman Emperor Augustus, I'm talking about these links, family links, and here we've got Geoffrey of Mon Monmouth making the point about the family links. Emperor, Roman Emperor Augustus equipped Jesus, this is, with weapons for the journey from Rome. And this place, Jesus in Britain, at least one, uh, once before the age of 23, before Augustus died in the year 14. The Essene doctrine, so closely associated with Druidism, that its origin may be said to be Druidic, and the Druids' beliefs were the same as those entertained by the Essene. The Cimmerians, the ancestors of the Celts, held fast the patriarchal faith of the Old Testament, and so did the Essene. We all know from Matthew, cut uh, Jesus on law, so whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And Confucius had the same message, do unto others you would have them do unto you. The concept of the Judaism at that time, that these ethical considerations were being undermined by an exaggerated rabbinical concern with ritual restrictions and the finer points of law, and the centre of Judaism shifted from prophetic values to obedience to rules and prohibitions regulating the smallest details of daily life. Just like Britain today. And he didn't like it. Origin of Alexander, a key, key figure, big, big name. And the divine goodness of our Lord and Saviour is equally diffused among the Britons, the Africans and other nations of the world. So let's just have a quick look at the Druids. A lot of the monks knew what was going on. And this lovely quote here, St. Plathmac, in about 1750, the word Druid appears in a poem by St. Plathmac, who wrote about Jesus, saying he was better than a prophet, more knowledgeable than every Druid, a king who was a bishop and a complete sage. It's, it's acknowledged that Jesus was described as a Druid by Columba and regarded as my Druid by Rowan Williams. Britain was the centre of civilization before 45 BC. Great sophistication. It would have been natural for Joseph to send their heir of a Dravidic bloodline to England in those early years. And most of you know how sophisticated the Druids was. Over 60,000 students. They were being taught astronomy on Bodmin Moor from 2,500 BC. Um, it was the Druids who gave the letters, the Phoenician letters, to the Greeks, the Greek writing, and the Greeks adopted it over a hundred year period, and that's Martin Bernal, a Cambridge scholar, 
in the Black Athena. Ireland was once I-R-I-E-I-R, the place called by the Hindus the seat of religion, the realm of the great Nadreds. Nadreds is another word for druid serpents or angels. The blessed lands of light where thousands of people traveled from across the world to be taught in the temples. And of course, temple, it comes from the word tamon, which is really an administrative building, rather like a mosque is today. We had free hospitals for the populace. The Druids also taught from their tamons that the path to true salvation was by work on oneself, by finishing the opus and obtaining physical and spiritual perfection. Part of their philosophical view centered on the sun god named Isus, who was crucified, dies, and rises from the dead a thousand years before Christianity existed. And the breath on law was superior to that which followed St. Patrick, particularly in terms of all the issues that were related to the rights of women. Quite extraordinary. We're all been told, you know, they were all painted savages, and it's quite the opposite. And, and the de de deeper you dig, the more interesting it becomes, and the more evidence there is. This is Ireland. 2,589, it was visited by Menes, and Menes was the son of Sumerian King Sargon. And Menes was the governor of the Indus Valley colony until he left to take up the role of king in the newly independent Egypt. He was also known as Naram Singh. He died from a hornet or wasping in Ireland in 2,589. So the people building the pyramids, putting all of the sophistication into Egypt, uh, he had time to go and visit Ireland. And Sargon I went down the uh, Silk Road uh, in um, 2700, um, so a little bit less than that, 2650, with the Baxing tribes when they had to leave Mesopotamia. And that Baxing tribe migration took the former occupants of Sumeria down the Silk Road into India and more particularly took civilization into China, sophistication into China. So Nungti um, was a key figure. Sargon was the same person as Shen Nun. They were traveling the world. International Druids. The Maruts, Rudras, and Petris are esteemed fiery dragons of wisdom as magicians and Druids were of old. Hans F.K. Gunther. And uh, Beres of Adelis, also um, excellent books on the Druids. Uh, what about the Druids themselves? A cast incorporating all the learned professions, philosophers, judges, teachers, historians, poets, musicians, physicians, astronomers, prophets, and political advisors or counsellors. And this is a very important point. Jesu Christos, or Jesu. It isn't coincidence that Druids had a title for the highest initiate. Jesu Christos, or Isa Krios. When Christianity preached Jesus as God, it preached the most familiar name of its own deity to Druidism. And in the ancient British tongue, Jesus has never assumed its Greek, Latin, or Hebrew form, but remains pure Druidic Jesu. Very important evidence. Those were the seats of the chief Druids in Britain. Massive cities as the basis of all our counties in this country. And the three seats of the Archdruids was London, um, York, and Caerleon in Wales. Pontius Pilate attended these Druid universities, very important, and his guards were the Scots guards. And the man who put the spear into Jesus' side was one of Pontius Pilate's Scots guards. And that was to release the fluid in his lungs from hanging up and saving his life. Barry Dunford, again, um, Forthingal, great Druidic academy in Scotland, and Scotland kept its independence and was just as important as Ireland. And some say Shambhala. The uninformed may think the Druids as wily pagans, dancing around campfires and sacrificing animals. It's hardly an accurate rendering. The Druids' beliefs were as sophisticated as any spiritual teaching in the world. They believed in reincarnation, the immortality of the soul, the purity of nature, and the handiwork of God. And Columba um, regarded Christ as the new Druid, and Columba was a key figure in Iona, and that was British Christianity 
right up to the time of the Synod of Whitby in 644. And we have somebody called Columbanus, who was the greatest monastery builder right the way through Europe as far as Kiev. And that was British Christianity, nothing to do with Roman Catholicism. And it was about education, education, education. They knew the earth was round, etc. And this is another reference uh, that one of the Buddhist uh, uh, specialists said. He told Jenkins that uh, Shambhala had once occupied the island of Britain in the last centuries before Christ, before translocating to India, although, some, although somehow it may still exist in Britain. Jesus in India, drama of the last disciples, is just a, a lot of people felt that he'd gone to India. And then we get this very, very clear evidence from that fantastic um, YouTube video made by the Indian government. Uh, very important. And these are coins struck in uh, Jesus' honour in India during the first century. And as I said earlier, he was regarded as an equal to and successor of Buddha. Uh, this man has been vilified, um, outrageous in my opinion. Uh, he was a great artist, a great scholar. He wrote three books. He traveled uh, the, the world, in fact, all the important places with his wife. Um, he, he understood who Kali was, the Earth Mother Goddess. Kali is another name for our <coughs> Ninkar Sag, who we talked about earlier. His credentials, but Nicholas Urch was far more than a painter. He was also an esteemed professor at the Imperial Archaeological Institute in Russia, as well as a respected philosopher, diplomat, and mystic. Urch and his Helena, his wife, and their son George traveled across Central Asia between 1923 and 1928 with a task of collecting archaeological and anthropological information. He's made out to be a cheap journalist who just scribbled something. That's the link to that website, which gives evidence on Jesus being in Kashmir. Very, very important. Tied in with all the things that I'm saying, um, we seem to have a, a fantastic story of Jesus not only being a prophet to Islam, but we also have him being um, a, a figure for the Hindus, Buddhists. And we also know that Buddhism went into China and the Thomas Church, and Thomas was in China. So this is a summary. We're near the end. Now, Polydor Virgilio was commissioned by Henry VII to write the history of Britain. And he was the Pope's tax collector. And Henry VII very sensibly said, well, why don't you do um, a compile a history of the British nation for me? Uh, and um, he found lodgings at Wells. Um, and... Um, he produced this incredible record, um, and his, his studies in Italy had suggested only a tribal nation of barbarians and sorcerers, but once in England he discovered an ancient land of great learning and rich kingdoms. By 1534, the results of his research were 26 books entitled Angelicae Historicae, tracing back to the early days of the Roman occupation. He wrote in his section concerning the reign of Emperor Nero. Arivagus was the principal chief in Britain during the, the Principate of Nero. At this time, Joseph of Arimathea, who according to Matthew the Evangelist gave burial to Christ's body, either by happenstance or in accordance to God's will, came into Britain with no small company of followers, where both he and his companions earnestly preached the gospel and teaching of Christ. By this, many men were converted to true piety, filled with this wholesome fruit, and were baptized. These men were assuredly full of Holy Spirit. They received, as a king's gift, a small plot of land about four miles from the town of Wells, which is Glastonbury, where they laid the first foundations of a new religion, and where today there is a magnificent church and a Benedictine monastery. The name of the place is Glastonbury. The first beginnings of Christian piety existed in Britain. This is from a Catholic from the Pope's own personal tax collector. Polidor Virgilio, in the reign of Henry VII, and after him Cardinal Pole, both rigid Roman Catholics, affirmed in Parliament, the latter in his address to the Catholic Prince Philip of Spain. Remember, Prince Philip of Spain and Mary, Queen of Scots, got married. Um, and then she had her head cut off. 
And Britain was the first of all countries to receive the Christian faith. In fact, Podolo Virgo got locked up for a while because it didn't go down very well at that particular time. The glory of Britain, remarked Jenny Brand, consists not only of this, but she was the first country which, in a national capacity, publicly professed herself Christian, but that she made this confession when the Roman Empire itself was pagan and a real persecutor of Christianity. Now, the response to that, as a result, the Vatican librarian Cardinal Cesare Baronius undertook to investigate and to expand on the earlier works of Eusebius and from then extensive, the then extensive library collection in Rome. Beginning in 1570, his research took 30 years to complete, and his chronicle was compiled into 12 folios entitled Annales Ecclesiasticae Acristanatae Anum 1198. Uh, ecclesiastical annals from the Nativity of Christ from 1198, published in 1601, and contrary to what the church hierarchy were anticipating, the Baronius work confirmed that the British records consulted by Polydor Virgulo were indeed correct. Even as far back as the acknowledged church fathers, Tertullian of Carthage had written in AD 208 about the early haunts of the Britons inaccessible to the Romans but subjugated to Christ. So the overview was, Rome was not the founding seat of the Christian faith. The movement, movement began in Britain, notably at Glastonbury, some while before St. Paul went to Rome. Emperor Constantine proclaimed Christianity as a state religion of Rome because he had been born, raised, lived until his imperial appointment as a Christian, as a Christian in York. Just before his death, he received an Arian Christian bishop, the style of Christianity that he had encountered in Britain. What St. Augustine brought from Rome to England, AD 1597, was not Christianity, but commonly taught, but Catholicism. And this is very, very important. Conclusion. Notwithstanding all the centuries of historical and monastic documentary record in England, the most comprehensive survey on the subject of Christian, Christian religious heritage was that of the Vatican librarian, Cardinal Cesare Baronius. Having spent 30 years researching the Vatican, and Lateran Palace Archives, he is regarded as the most learned ever scholar of church history, and his 1601 Annales Ecclesiasticae is one of the foremost documents of Christian literature ever written. Despite all the orthodox propaganda of Rome, however, Baronius deduced that Polydor, Eusebius, Tertullian, Gildas, Williams of Malmesbury, Geoffrey of Monmouth and all the others, including St. Augustine, have been correct. Rome was not the founding city of Christianity. The first beginnings of Christian Christianity existed in Britain. Its birthplace from A35 was Glastonbury. And then we know that Constantine produced the Edict of Milan, which was religious toleration, and he gave the land and money to Sylvester, and he specifically wanted it to be education, 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 as were the British monasteries. It didn't happen. Um, and we, we didn't have uh, a continuation of what had been put in place in Britain. And this is what Baronius, Cesare Baronius, said on Constantine. A man must be mad who in the face of universal antiquity refuses to believe that Constantine and his mother were Britons born in Britain. And over 20 European authorities affirm this fact. AD 380, Rome under Emperor Theodosius declares Catholic Christianity as the religion of the Roman Empire, escalating Arian Christian persecution. They went out and killed Arian Christians. 610, the papacy was created. The Roman Catholic Church invented the term Pope to be above bishops. The British Church had bishops only. And the statement uh, by Augustine, by the British Church, the British Church tried to fight back in 607 AD. It's a protest of the British Church in refusing to accept St. Augustine, signed on its behalf by the Archbishop of St. David, six bishops, and the Bishop of Bangor, who conducted the conference with Augustine at Augustine's Oak. Be it known and declared that we all, individually and collectively, 
are all in humility prepared to defer to the Church of God and to the Bishop of Rome, and to every sincere and godly Christian, so far as to love every one according to his degree in perfect charity, and to assist them all by word and in deed in becoming children of God. But as far as any other obedience, we know of none that he you term that he you term the Pope or Bishop of Bishops can demand. The deference we have mentioned. Uh, we are ready to pay to him, as every other Christian. But in all other respects, our obedience is due to the jurisdiction of the Bishop of Caerleon, or St. David's, who is alone under God, our ruler, to keep us right in the way of salvation. And the first meeting here, it says, we have one, have one voice, we have nothing to do with Rome, we know nothing of the Bishop of Rome and his new character of Pope, we are the British Church the Archbishop of which is accountable to God alone, having no superior on earth. And Francis Bacon and the government of England says, the Britons told Augustine they would not be subject, subject to him, nor let him pervert the ancient laws of their church. And then we had the destruction, as I say, of Bangor on Dee, the Battle of Chester, where um, anything between 1,200 and 2,000 monks were, they were all fighting and, and defending the Welsh kings and total destruction. That was really, um, if you like, genocide of the best of our intellectuals at uh, Bangor on Dee at the Battle of Chester, AD 16, and children aren't taught that in schools. And the Synod of Whitby, uh, on the excuse that they were going to discuss the tonsature or how the haircut should be, whether you have a round thing in the middle or over from ear to ear, and the date of Easter, on the, on the basis of that and getting everybody together, they ended up by the Roman Catholic Church proclaimed as the British religion on the casting vote of the King of Northumberland, Oswui, or whatever his name is, who had asked both sides if they agreed that Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven by Christ and pronounced to be the rock on which the church was built, to which half of those attending agreed to the Roman and Petrine practices. So the casting vote meant that the Northumberland king got his way. This ended the influence of the Druidic Iona, Columbanus, British Christianity, and the brilliant educator St. Hilda, abbess of the double monastery, later called Whitby Abbey. And there's never been a scrap of evidence that Peter uh, actually was the first pope or first bishop or had any right and to be claimed as the first bishop, bearing in mind all the other information that you've seen here. The Nation of Constantine, final act, was a forged document, a Roman imperial decree, by which the Emperor Constantine supposedly transferred authority over Rome and the western part of the Roman Empire to the Pope. It was used, especially in the 13th century, in support of claims of political authority by the papacy. Italian Catholic priest and humanist is credited with the first, the first exposing the forgery with solid philological arguments in 1439 to 40. But this enabled popes to overrule the appointment of kings and queens, gave complete and utter authority over every country by the pope, complete takeover. Papal councils. This was discussed at Pisa, Constance, Siena, Baal. And in 1933, the Vatican reaffirms that the first Christian church was in Britain. Now, we've got all, so much there, but do you hear anybody saying today that was the case? Well, it is the case. And of course, Henry VIII, everybody blames Henry VIII for the dissolution of the monasteries, gives him a hard time. Um, but he was, he, father, of course, Henry VII, instigated this a wonderful history by Polydor Virgilio, and was the m most intelligent probably ever of any of our kings, and certainly Henry was no slouch, and particularly his daughter Elizabeth I. And Henry would have known the Glastonbury story and the Arthur connection, because King Arthur was involved in this one too, but I haven't touched on it. His father had commissioned Polydor Virgilio's history bed to establish the truth. Now his dissolution of the monasteries had two primary purses, purposes. Ending Catholic corruption, much the same as Martin Luther wanted to end the corruption of a church. But secondly, far more importantly, to raise money to defend Britain from an invasion from Catholic Spain and France. If Henry hadn't have done that, we would have been taken over by the Spanish and the French, and we nearly did 
lose out to the Spanish, if you remember, which was Philip of Spain coming back with a vengeance. And we managed somehow to survive a thousand years or more without being invaded again. Henry felt so badly about the Pope that this painting hangs in Hampton Court today, which is uh, um, the four evangelists stoning the Pope. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John stoning the Pope. That was the sentiment of the times. And you can see there's a great deal of justification for it. The genealogy of our royal family goes right back to Judah and takes in David. Another extraordinary link in our chain and evidence of all of us coming from the land of Israel and Judah or that general area and all our ancestors having cross-fed like mad. And if you look at population dynamics, um, we're also mixed up genetically that it's crazy to call one person one thing or one person another. So we can forget about Jew. Um, we've got to realize where we actually came from, uh, from a tiny population, because the great catastrophe, 10,800, uh, was the biggest mass extinction for three million years, and there were very few humans left on the planet uh, when we started uh, the warm-up after the Younger Trials. Elizabeth I, another final clue. This was a painting when they x-rayed it and found she was holding a snake. <laughs> Uh, the symbol of the shining ones of the serpent knowledge, which was good, nothing bad about it. And this was, of course, discovered by people like Francis Bacon and John Dee and all the new movement of the time. And she's got paintings holding the serpent in her hand as a symbol that she knew the truth. And there she is, one of the loveliest pictures of her, um, Queen Elizabeth of the rain rainbow portrait. And the papal authority was denounced by Queen Elizabeth in A.D. 1600. Britain's priority in the Christian church, Christ is the head of the church, repeated by Queen Elizabeth II in 1953, despite Roman Catholic's pressure to have this removed from her oath. And here we have the simple message of Confucius, of Jesus of all time, with Henry George, um, brilliant man, American, here is the conclusion to the whole matter, that we should do unto others as we would have them do unto us, that we should respect the rights of others as scrupulously as we would have our own rights respected, and not a mere counsel of perfection to individuals, but is the law to which we must conform social institutions and national policy if we would secure the blessings of abundance and peace. A brilliant statement. So, there we are. We are all God's representatives on earth. Thank you very much for sitting and listening.